When you're building a responsive website, it can be difficult to figure out exactly how to write your media queries and what breakpoints you should use. Should you use min width or max width in your breakpoints? And what devices should you be targeting with your styles anyway? We'll be answering all these questions and more in this tutorial. Now first, a bit of context. So let's check out Mozilla Developer Network, or MDN. So it says that the app media is a CSS at rule. And if we look here, we can see that there are quite a few different rules. The one that we're using today is the app media rule. It says it's a conditional group rule that will apply its content if the device meets the criteria of the condition defined using a media query. So this means that we can use different CSS rules depending on whether the user is loading a website using a phone, tablet, or a desktop screen. And they are what make responsive design possible because in responsive design, we usually use device widths as the criteria when writing our media queries. So let's take more of a closer look at how media queries can be used. All right, so for this tutorial, I have some demo code that's going to help illustrate responsive design and media queries and breakpoints. And in this, I have an index.html file, it just has an h1 tag here. And then I have my styles in the style.scss file. And I am using the VS Code extension live SAS to automatically compile my SAS file into a CSS file in the dist folder. And that is what is loaded up here in my index.html file. Now let's take a closer look at our styles. So going back to our style.scss file, we have our styles for our h1 tag here. Now at the top, we have first our default font size, and that's going to be three rems. And you can convert from rems to pixels by multiplying three times 16. And it's 16 because the default font size for browsers is 16 pixels, which equals one rem. So three rems ends up being 48 pixels. Then you can see we have our media uh, media query here, and we have an alternate style for font size, and that is 4.5 rems. And if you multiply that by 16, you get 72 pixels. So we have our default font size of 3 rems, or 48 pixels, and then we have our alternate font size of 4.5 rems, or 72, was it? 72 pixels. Now let's take a closer look at the media query in our styles here. So if we look at the media query, we can see that it's made up of two parts. The first part is the app media at rule, which we'd mentioned earlier. And the second part is what's called a media feature rule. Now the media feature that we are targeting is the width of the user's viewport, which would be the screen on their desktop or browser window size. It could also be the device width itself if they're using a phone or a tablet device. Now what we're doing is we're actually targeting a range of viewport widths by using the min width in our media feature rule. So what this means is that any width of 43.75 EMs or greater, and 43.75 EMs converts to about 688 pixels. So any width that is 688 pixels or greater is going to meet the criteria of our media query, and thus turn on the alternate CSS rule of font size of 4.5 rems. So if the user's viewport meets the criteria in our media query, the CSS rule will take precedent in the styles. And it's going to override our default rule of font size three rems because this media query rule is actually more specific than the default rule. Now this brings us to our next point of breakpoints. In responsive design, the widths that we're targeting in our media queries are called breakpoints because that's the point at which our design changes and we're using different CSS styles. In our example here, our breakpoint is the 43.75 EMs or 688 pixels wide. And the cool thing about breakpoints is that you can actually add as many as you want. So if we wanted to, we could keep increasing that H1 font size at different uh, viewport widths. So let's say maybe at 62 EMs, which is about 688 pixels, we could increase the font size to five rems. And then if we wanted to increase it even more, we could say 87 EMs, which is just under 1400 pixels wide. So that's kind of like a large desktop size. And let's say we wanted to increase that to 6.5 rems. So you can see that you can really have a lot of freedom in terms of how many breakpoints that you want to add and also what widths that you want to add in your breakpoints. So you might be asking yourself, okay, well, how many breakpoints should you be using and what widths should you be using for your breakpoints? Here's one rule of thumb. Don't try to create tons of media queries trying to target every device width that exists. This was a practice back in the early days of responsive design, but nowadays with so many different phones, tablets, and screen sizes, it's simply not practical. 
you're only going to end up with a confusing and inefficient number of media queries. Instead, try to choose breakpoints based on your design. So let's take a look back at our H1 styles here. Now, when you're creating responsive styles and media queries, what you want to do is you want to start from the mobile widths and then kind of move your way on up, setting breakpoints in a range. And what I usually do is I'm going to choose maybe three to four breakpoints, and they're all going to stretch from the mobile tablet widths up through screen widths. And so I know that every device and every screen size is going to be covered somewhere in this range of responsive styles. So we can see here, our first breakpoint is at 43.75 EMs or 700 pixels. And we can assume that all mobile devices are going to be under 700 pixels. So they're all going to take this first style of three rem for the font size. Then moving up to in width to tablets, we, we know that most tablets are going to be somewhere between 700 pixels and 992 pixels, which is our next breakpoint at 62 EMs. So we can assume that all tablets are going to be 4.5 rems um, within this range here. Then the next breakpoint of 62 EMs or 992 pixels, we can assume that small screens are going to be around, you know, a thousand pixels wide, and then up to maybe our last breakpoint of about 1400 pixels wide. Then the last breakpoint in the last um, set of media queries and styles, we know that large screens are going to be, you know, anything above 1400 pixels, and they're all going to take the last style of 6.5 RAMs. So in this way, we, our approach is letting us cover all devices within this range of viewport widths. And this is good because, you know, working with a smaller set of breakpoints is going to help you keep your responsive styles consistent. So let's say if I was building out more pages with these styles, I would always try to use these same breakpoints, you know, 700 pixels, 992, 1392 pixels, um, just so that I know that all the styles are going to be changing at the same viewport widths. You don't have to choose exactly the widths that I have here. You know, you're welcome to choose your own range and just figure out sort of what fits you best. But at least when you have a consistent set of breakpoints in your media queries, you're not just creating random breakpoints at all different widths and then, you know, potentially creating some unexpected behavior. So keep things simple, stick to one set of breakpoints, and you can always add an additional breakpoint, you know, somewhere in the middle here or on either end if you find a need for it. Now, one common question that I do see a lot is, should you use min width or max width or both in your breakpoints? And the approach that I myself use is to use primarily min width only in your breakpoints. And this is the same approach that I've seen in frameworks like Bootstrap or Foundation, or even big web dev sites like Smashing Magazine and CSS Tricks. And the reason that most people seem to do that is because usually your mobile styles are going to be simpler than your desktop styles. So, you know, on mobile, you might have all the content stacked in one column, Whereas when you get up to desktop widths, you know, that's when you're going to turn on Flexbox and Grid and, you know, have different, more complicated CSS layouts. And having your mobile styles and default styles means that you can simply add on those additional rules in your media queries. And as opposed to the other way, let's say you were using only max width media queries, meaning, you know, everything from this width on down, then you would have to have your desktop styles be the default styles, and you would then have to cancel out, you know, all those additional CSS rules for, you know, tablet widths and mobile widths. So this would kind of cause you to write some maybe unneeded CSS rules to cancel out those desktop styles for mobile and tablet. So I find it kind of simpler to approach it this way, but let's take a look at an actual real world example of how this works. Here's another demo website. In our web page here, we have two blocks. We have our main content block, which is blue. Then we have a pink sidebar block. And you can see that we are currently using Flexbox to make them a side-by-side -side in this two column layout. But then when you go down to tablet and mobile widths, we are stacking the content. So we have the sidebar under the main content. Let's take a look at the actual code for this now. So in our index.html file, we have the main element for the main content, the blue content. Then we have an aside element for the magenta sidebar, and they're both direct child elements of the body tag. So looking at the styles, let's see how we've written them here. And again, I'm using the min width approach in terms of um, using our breakpoints. So the mobile styles for this are actually quite simple in terms of layout. We don't need any additional CSS just to simply stack the elements one, one on top of the other because, you know, that's how the block elements usually behave. But then for larger widths, so starting at 62 EMs or 992 pixels wide, once you have a viewport of that size, then we want to basically turn on Flexbox. 
So in our body tag, you can see that in the media query, and again, this is using the SAS syntax, we're turning on Flexbox with display flex. And then in the same way for the main and the aside elements, which are the flex children of the body tag, we are in the media query adding the flex property. So for the main content, it's going to be 75% of the width and the aside sidebar is going to have just 25%. Okay, so what would happen if we wanted to use max width media queries instead of min width media queries? So how this would look different in our styles is we would change this to say max width approach. And again, for the max width approach, what this means is the desktop styles are going to be the default styles. And then we would have to add mobile and tablet styles in a media query. So let's make our desktop styles of display flex the default style. Then we're just going to flip around this media query here. So it's going to say max width of 62 EMs. So what this means is that anything less than 992 pixels will take the styles in here. So since display flex is our default, in order to turn off Flexbox, we need to add display lock. And we'll kind of do the same thing down here. So we'll move the desktop style to be default. And then you actually don't have to, you know, type in flex none um, since we're turning off Flexbox. So we actually don't need to write anything else here. We're just going to have the default style and get rid of that media query. So in this example, you know, both min width and max width approaches, I think are probably fine. Um, again, it's just my personal preference to just use min width media queries whenever possible, simply because at least in this case, I don't have to cancel out the flex box with a display block CSS rule. There's one more thing I just wanted to mention and that is, you know, you might be curious why I'm using EMs in my breakpoints as opposed to pixels. Of course, pixels are more familiar to all of us. We know what a pixel is pretty much. And we have to do that sort of conversion factor to convert from 62 EMs times 16 equals 992 pixels. Uh, it's just a little bit of an extra step. So it is a bit of a pain. You know, I totally understand that. However, there is a reason to use EMs versus pixels for your breakpoint widths. And that is for accessibility, because whereas pixels are absolute units and they never change, the relative units like EMs and REMs, they are relative to other factors on the page. And in our case, when we're using EMs for our breakpoints, they're going to be relative to basically what the base font size on your browser is. And you get the same effect when you use REMs for all your text font sizes. And this is important because for accessibility reasons, if you have users who, let's say, they need to zoom in on the page or they need to even change their base font size in their browser settings, if you're using pixels for important properties like font size and breakpoints, you're not going to give the user the ability to control making the text, you know, bigger if they need to, because, you know, pixels are absolute, so they never change. So even if you do zoom in on a page, if a text is set at, you know, 20 pixels for their font size, it's just always going to be 20 pixels no matter what as opposed to if you'd set the font size in REMs or EMs, then you know it would change depending on what your zoom level is. So it's really kind of an accessibility issue here. So that's one reason why I use EMs. So that's it for media queries and breakpoints. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you have any comments, you can leave them down below. And if you're not following me yet, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching and keep on coding.